Welcome to this session on incontinence. This is looking at people, particularly the older person, who either lives in a residential care home setting or lives in their own home. It will also cover people who have got some sort of neurological condition, something like multiple sclerosis. So we will in this session talk about the different types of continence and incontinence. We will discuss a little bit about faecal incontinence and I will give you some hints and tips on how to treat continence. So to start with, we'll talk about stress incontinence, one of the most common types of incontinence that affects women. However, to remember that it does affect men as well. But it is found mostly after women have had their babies, maybe had their prolapses repaired, maybe had hysterectomies. It can be a result of obesity, or it can be a little bit to do with the size of a prostate gland or something else that is going wrong within that patient. So stress incontinence is when the pelvic floor, which is the hammock, which holds everything up, is actually weak. It's not being used and exercised sufficiently. And this is something we'll cover later. The symptoms of stress incontinence are if you cough, sneeze, jump or even stand up that there is some leakage of urine so it's quite easily identified it very rarely happens at night it's usually in the day so this is stress incontinence brought on by movement the second symptom that people seem to talk about is urge incontinence this is more commonly known now as overactive bladder. Now there are two things to remember. An overactive bladder speaks for itself. It's when you've got frequency, urgency and you need to get to the toilet quite quickly. However, there is a condition which gives these symptoms which is called detrusor instability and we'll deal with that separately. However, urge incontinence can be caused by many things. Most commonly, it's an infection when there's that burning and stinging and you've actually got to rush to the toilet. But a lot of patients, particularly older people, will not have that stinging sensation, but they've still got the symptoms of urgency and frequency. And this is when the bladder muscle keeps contracting and is trying to get rid of something that's irritating it. With urge incontinence, occasionally what can happen is a very large volume of urine will leak out. And as I say, at night, this can be a real problem. Which takes me on to another type of continence issue, which is called nocturia. Now this is particularly a problematic in caring for people who are older. What you don't want is patients getting up at night, falling downstairs, fracturing hips. You need them to be safe and looked after in their rooms. So what we need to do is look at nocturia. Nocturia is brought around by the ageing process. We produce more urine at night, all of us do that anyway, in the first three hours of sleep. So it might be that you have to wake somebody or actually they have to toilet themselves, set the alarm clock within the first three hours of sleep. This will get rid of the first flush of urine. The other thing that we need to do is remember that some people get what we call polyurea. And again, this is to do with all the changes that go along with the body as we, as we progress with age. So these patients, again, are difficult to manage. But it is important that we remember that with nocturia, patients, it is normal to get up once or twice at night after the age of 50. So we need to cater for this not just leave them in bed and expect them to sit in urine.
The other type of incontinence is overflow. These again can be quite complicated patients and it can be a result of the prostate gland being very enlarged. So when the gentleman goes to the toilet, it's a bit like standing on a hose pipe. Not all the urine can get out in one go. It needs a lot of pressure behind it. So the gentleman will pass urine, that muscle will get tired and will leave quite a big puddle behind. But this can be caused as well by nerve damage to do with other neurological conditions. However, there is a condition that men will get which is called dribbling incontinence. And that's something that you often see gentlemen will go to the toilet, finish, put himself away, make himself decent, start to walk back up the corridor and a large wet patch appears. This is when urine gathers in the urethra, the tube from the bladder to the outside world. And quite considerable amount can stay there. In other words, about 80 to 100 mils. So they need to be able to be taught to get rid of that amount of fluid. So it's not the bladder, it's just that the closing mechanism isn't very good and it stays in that tube. So that's dribbling incontinence, another condition very common in older people. But overflow can occur in women, but it's not as common, except those women who have multiple sclerosis. I'd like to just touch on faecal incontinence because faecal incontinence is almost really like the last taboo. There is nothing worse than patients getting constipated and having faecal leakage. It is important that we actually assess these patients just as clearly as we have assessed the urine incontinence. One of the biggest problems that aggravate the bladder is when the patient is constipated. It has more problems than when women have babies. The constipation is the biggest cause of stress incontinence and overactive uh, bladder with the urgency and frequency. Constipation is usually the result of not enough fluids. It's the result of poor mobility. It's the result of lack of exercise and poor diet. Nearly everybody I come across with urinary problems are usually constipated as well. Very rarely do I find somebody who is not. So one should assume your patient's constipated until proven otherwise. So again, keep a chart, maintain what's happening, think about the tools that you can get to help you, such as the Bristol stool chart. Again, within this um, package, you will find an example of the Bristol stool chart, which will help you recognize what to do and, what to, and how to treat the patient.